Hello, this is Derek Hansen for strengthpowerspeed.com. I want to introduce our first podcast of 2017. Uh, we call them our performance concept chats. And myself and John Abreu will be interviewing James Smith on his new book, The Governing Dynamics of Coaching. Uh, in this podcast, we get into James's background in terms of his educational background military background and also his coaching experiences and all of this interestingly enough forms the basis of a lot of his thought processes about sport and sport coaching specifically um, some of the stuff that we discuss um, could be deemed controversial in terms of the conventions of sport these days but i think it raises some interesting questions about you know ideas things we should be looking at in terms of developing athletes and just developing our approach to uh, sporting events, uh, team sports and individual sports. So if you have questions and comments, I'll have some information at the end of the uh, podcast here where you can contribute and we'd like to get more feedback. So for now, please enjoy our podcast with James Smith. Hey James, uh, it's really good to have you on board here, and I know we've talked privately a lot, just you know about our own thoughts and training and rehabilitation. So it's great to get you sort of, you know, talking more publicly with me and uh, John here. So can you give us a bit of a background on you know what you've done in the past and kind of what it's led you to currently? Sure. Thank you for having me on. I know this will be. A fulfilling discussion and with respect to what I've done I think it most helpful to quote the words of Bane from the Dark Knight Rises in so far as it doesn't matter who we are what matters is our plan and I state that because the the most that anyone could possibly get from listening to an uh, open discussion such as the one that we will have, will be the knowledge that is possessed within the discourse. So f allow me then to provide the elevator version on, on who I am in, in order that we can get to what in my judgment will be the most meaningful aspects of the discussion, which is to state that I'm a music school graduate. I graduated from Berklee College of Music with a bachelor's in performance, in which jazz was my concentration. I followed that up with five years of military service, in which case uh, I joined the Navy only to become a Navy SEAL, which was an endeavor that I ultimately failed at twice, never by my own volition. However, I failed to graduate twice, once for performance reasons and another for medical reasons. Following the military, I spent 10 years coaching and consulting it in various capacities at various places in the US, England and Portugal and for the last five years I've only been consulting and what I'll conclude with is the the realm in which I was paid to coach was one that I was never fulfilled with by doing and as a result I often was very ambiguous in describing what I did to people who I would meet outside of sports because I did not feel good fully about what I was doing due to the dysfunctional role that it plays in what my judgment is the dysfunctional culture of sports in general. So I was fortunate to be consulting at the same time that I was coaching, going back now, the, the better part of... 14, 15 years, and as the consultant, I always had the non-fragmented reach in assisting others in advancing their knowledge without being stereotyped to a particular job profile and therefore able to assist others in a variety of different job profiles, many of whom not even related to the sport profession. So. I'll here, here I sit, a consultant. 
So, obviously, you've had what I would call an unconventional route to where you are now, but that doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, quite honestly, when, when you tell people about your background, are people thrown by it? Does it change their perception of what you can contribute? So, I generally avoid referring to my background <laughs> for the, the Im, Im, implicit liabilities that are represented, such as what you just referenced, in that it's, it's far too convenient for people to filter information in which they hear from anything other than a purely objective source, such as some form of artificial intelligence. And that f filter is based upon whether they're conscious or not, stereotypes, right or wrong, that are associated with job titles, for example. So as a consultant, I've had the luxury in, in the variety of consulting roles that I've served of not having to address any specifics as to my history as the, the, the nature in which I'm being compensated is, is not related to su supplying some form of historical background, but rather knowledge that is pertinent to advance the situation. Now, um, again, thinking just about your background, uh, do you feel like uh, going through music school, obviously a very uh, creative uh, type of environment, uh, how has that impacted uh, your craft, your consulting, your coaching? Yes. Well, you know, all of us have the benefit of hindsight. And I'll be the first one to admit that I, I cannot state to any degree of accuracy what my mindset was through the years and and how that would regard how I could answer your question definitively. So what, what I can tell you as being as objective as, as I can be is that the rigors that I went through at Berkeley, which is a, which is a rigorous, it consists of rigorous curricula, particularly the performance program that I was involved in and, and, and even more so due to the rigors of understanding the language of jazz, that in, in no doubt the mathematical relationships that are intrinsic to understanding music harmony and melody and sound, and et cetera, are fundamentally relevant to, to all things in, in, in essence, particularly in terms of the physical world is, is, is physics, is mathematics applied to the physical world. And at the, at the same time when I was a student at Berkeley, I began developing a library of physics books, which was, you know, I po post teenage years, I lost all interest in what most people conventionally understand as recreation. So I, I, I don't recreate in, in terms of what, it, how I understand the definition. So for me, physics has always been what I would spend the bulk of my free time self studying. And mathematics is the operating unifier between all realms of physics. And so the, the linkage between music, physics, motion, all, all things sport related are contained within this fundamental framework that is shared between these other subject matter, matter realms. And so I, I believe it to be a, a very, I'm very fortunate to have gone through the set of experiences that I did and and I do believe subjectively that I benefited greatly from them in terms of how I approach problem solving. Awesome. I I totally agree. It was funny. I was talking to Al Vermeil the other day and he's doing a presentation. He's like, Oh, did you see that Jesse Owens movie, Race? And I guess they were they had a phonograph and they're playing a record like while they were training and the, the crappy coach came up and said, What what's with all that crappy music, right? And, yeah. But it, 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 you know, it, it is an intuitive thing that, that people take for granted. Um, yes. So you've also worked extensively with track and field athletes, and we've talked about this. I mean, I'm kind of the same uh, as you in terms of how I approach things, but how has that formed your opinions of physical preparation in, term, in terms of team sport athletes? Like, how, how have you made that transition so that you can – kind of operate under the same principles, but also work in a team sport environment. Yes. So it, the I, perhaps first important to, to, to footnote 
is that the the vast majority of my consulting and, and, and certainly the way things are moving forward actually has nothing to do with physical preparation. However, his, historically, there were components of that. And as you know well, due to your close work with, with Charlie, what, what I recognized up, upon studying his work, which for me began in 2003, was that the, the, the framework under which he communicated his understanding over the process was one which accounted for all neuromuscular structural load factors w w void of segregated categorizations. And so that principle that is shared with the most conscientious, usually head coaches of cyclical sport domains, some of which include, you know, the, 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 the track and field sprints, the speed skating, the sprint cycling, canoe, kayak, Nordic skiing, swimming, and particularly if there are economic restraints placed upon that individual, this, this governor of all modes of preparation is instantiated. And the value of that is immeasurable, particularly if that individual is well informed to the subject matter domains in which they and they alone govern. So being fortunate to have um, been exposed to Charlie's work bef before it, it, I, I had began being paid by athletes privately, but I had not yet been working with any teams at that point. It was it was not until the next year, and and fortunately, I began as a track coach, kind of working with sprinters, jumpers, and throwers at a high school. In addition to doing the physical preparation with American football, and so from the very beginning, I possessed this same global mindset that was so prevalent in the, 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 as you know, in the track community in general, it, whether or not, again, there's economic restraints or simply because that is the culture that's been developed by the individual, the, the, that individual who, let's say, is knowledgeable is then granted themselves the ability to govern the process from beginning to end. So whether it begins on the track and ends up somewhere else, a weight room or a physio room, it, it's under the watchful eye of the same individual. And so I carried that with me. And ironically, it's really only a fluke that I ended up working in physical preparation for the period of time that I did because I had no interest in making a, a career out of it. And in, in fact, when the offer came to, to go to the, to the university level in 2007, I turned it down because I had no interest. And it was only after further discussion from my wife at the time that I, I entertained it and ultimately moved forward with it because track was what I was really uh, and remain an astute uh, appreciator, fan, consultant. I, it's, it's, it's one of the sports that I love the most. And I was working with a super talented long jumper. More, he was a 100-meter long jumper. And it's, it's, I had some correspondence with Charlie at the time. This was in 2005. And this jumper actually posted a video just the other day on social media. He, on, on a, we were at a meet at Sac State, and he jumped over 27 feet, just barely fouling. I mean, he was centimeters over the toe board, but it, it, was a, it was representative of the ability that he had. He ended up PRing with me at 25, 10, 7, 5 after only three months working with him. And so, so track was the love. And it, it was only through, again, I, I say a fluke that I said, okay, I'll, I'll do the university level because uh, Buddy Morris, who, who was a good friend of mine, he, he offered for me to have complete autonomy over all of the skill players. And it, it was a financial bump. So that's the only reason that I, 
that I got into it as opposed to who knows what might have happened otherwise with with track and field and the the associated mindset remained with me so from you know I I just you know the book came out last month that I'm, I'm sure we'll get into it at some point during this discussion the mindset was there from the very beginning due to the the influence of that Charlie's work had on me because I I still have notes on my computer from my the high school days coaching where I would go to the whiteboard with the the head coach and the coordinators and show them how we can structure the entirety of preparation high low by disseminating the aspects of of what the world understands as practice though I believe that is a flawed char- categorization but what the world understands as practice consisting of modules of different aspect of preparation and I explained how aspects of defensive drills, offensive drills, individual special teams, seven on seven, nine on nine, et cetera, would, would be more fundamentally, would be more effectively categorized according to their force velocity fundamentals, which in that case fit nicely into the high low framework. And, you know, th- this is something I was talking about from the very beginning, which, which due to the ease of influencing some a high school program because you don't have the same unless perhaps you know Texas high school American football accepted you you don't have the same type of fear based decision making that inundates the coach that you find at the major college or the professional level and so therefore I had everyone's complete attention of course this failed to continue as I entered the collegiate realm in which the dysfunctions amplify and the segregations amplify and all the rest. And everyone tends to go to their own corner of the department and focus only on what their job title suggests. As wrong as it is, and as a, and as a consultant, I can tell you that's essentially the same all over the world in all kinds of different sports up to the professional and Olympic level. And so the frustration simply grew, grew, grew until I ultimately reached my threshold of tolerance and I could no longer operate professionally in that environment. Although my last year doing it was working with international rugby and it was a, it was a bit culturally a return to high school insofar as the rapport that I had with the head coach Errol Brain from New Zealand. He was the captain of the Maori All Blacks for eight years, so he's he's very well known in in Super Rugby circles. And we hit it off immediately, and and he accepted my governing role, so to speak, in terms of suggesting practice modulations and breakdowns of of, of aspects more fundamentally to work on skills that I felt were necessary based upon what I would see. And and even though I did not see his eye to eye with the sevens coach, I still had the same authority to govern everything. And so that, that was one of the most fulfilling, uh, of course, the talent level of the athletes was not so high. So there's, there, there's the, 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 the results internationally are not what one would have liked to see. However, professionally that was enjoyable for those stated reasons and then of course as a consultant since then from the beginning of uh, only doing consulting since the end of that 2012 season the i have the greatest degree of of liberty to affect things in the most unrestricted the, the most unrestricted sense well i mean let's just jump into the book i mean because a lot of what we're going to talk about is covered I, I honestly I haven't had a chance to, to, to see your book. We've talked a bit about it. I know John and I have talked a bit about the concepts and all that, but let's just jump into it because my next question is really going to be about the concept of the segregation within sports, physical preparation. Like you said, everybody's in their silo doing their own thing, and even things like the NCAA uh, encourages this separation. Like you only get to work with a strength coach. You know, the team coaches aren't even around, they don't know what the hell's going on. So. Yes. You know, I mean, I know John and I have both had struggles with working with team sports in terms of uh, these predefined roles in, in, in the, uh, 
entitlement that certain coaches have over certain things. And That's right. So, um, John, do you have any specific questions like uh, are relating to the you know what? Well, what James has been saying here. Um, I'm sure this is something that uh, we've all encountered at some point. But we have the the head coach who maybe tries to micromanage um, different aspects of where he should allow uh, people with the more expertise and to fulfill their role, and rather maybe just act, act as a an program overseer. So, in this um, maybe more integrated way of thinking. Uh, where somebody like yourself would have uh, oversight of uh, you know, practice um, plans and such, who should be in charge? Yes, good question. So what, what I would do is, su such as what I've highlighted in the book, is simply point one's attention to professions in which this has long since already been happening, uh, w w which is to state, how do we qualify who should be in charge? for what set of reasons, what, what good explanation is there to define who should be in charge. And to that I answer, let us simply look at so many of the professions that far predate sport. So not to be confused with the Greek Olympics in 776 BC, but the, the advent of sport as a profession, as a, system of organized competition, we're, what we're going back to is less than a hundred years at any high level. When you start talking about the instantiation of the professional leagues moving forward over the 1920s and the, the let alone the integration racially, 40 years after that, I mean, re really despicable in, in that context. So this is the babyhood of sports. We're still in it. We're still, we are the cavemen, all of us now, of sports in the same way that if we look back upon whether it was the beginning of, of medicine with Hippocrates or uh, ma mathematics with P Pythagoras, if, if, we, if we look back... Uh, and, and Archimedes, the, the teacher of Pythagoras, if, if we look back to th this two, 3,000 years ago, and we look at the first 100 years forward, so let's, take the, so let's take the 100 years forward of Archimedes and Pythagoras, and the way that we would discuss those individuals is the best we could possibly discuss any individuals in sport today that are deemed, uh, if, if it only remotely, as, as valuable to the condition of intellectual achievement in sport as Archimedes and or, or, or Anaximander, for, uh, not Archimedes, Anaximander was Pythagoras' teacher, as those two historically profound individuals. And so, so what are some of those professions? So I use in the book, as examples only, gastronomy, symphonic orchestral con conductors, small business owners, and what 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 do we what do we know about those leaders? What do we know about a competent executive chef? Bu building is another one. What do we know about a competent general contractor? What do we know about a competent symphonic orchestral conductor. So these industry leaders in their domains, what do they understand and to what level regarding the constituents that together comprise the greater collective, what do they know in a way that far eclipses the near whole of the sport coaching community Clearly there are exceptions, but we're talking in generalities here. And so that executive chef, if we analogously compare the assistants in a kitchen to assistant coaches, that the executive chef is the one in charge and maybe they have not cooked for a number of years perhaps, 
why are they the ones in charge? Well, one reason is because regardless of the type of kitchen that they run, they, as a competent executive, are going to have the tradecraft skill to show a working proficiency in every constituency that contributes to what ultimately amounts to the, the, the food on the plate at the table. So, so any competent executive will easily, after hours, take a group of their friends in to treat them to a, a well-prepared meal that they alone govern from beginning to end, regardless of the depth of complexity to the contributing specialty fields, uh, sauteing, roasting, filleting, sauces, rotisserie, et cetera, et cetera. All, all the different specialty uh, approaches, techniques to cooking, this competent executive is gonna give you everything from beginning to end. They're gonna have knowledge of where the produce came from, the conditions, the, the livestock, how they were raised, knowledge that far exceeds the, the physical confines of the space. And, and we, we simply transplant that to any other. Why is a competent general contractor the one in charge of the electricians, the heating, the cooling, the plumbing, the drywalling, the roofers, the framers. Why is this person in charge of these different specialty fields that each each of each of them is their own domain with with extraordinary complexity to each one because these these are careers in and of themselves. Why is this general contractor in charge of them? This well, the answer is the competent general contractor is in charge due to their competent understanding of all constituents, how to organize them, how to ensure everyone works together in the proper order and sequence, etc., such that the, the, the end result is, is the uh, efficient construction of the building, the, the structure, and so on. The symphonic orchestral conductor, the small business owner. So actually, I, I provide an anecdotal story in the book so, so Larry Fitzgerald is a, is a close friend of mine and I've been consulting with him for the, for the past three years. And I travel with him, I, I have traveled with him for six or seven weeks prior to his training camps. You know, we go overseas, we're all around the country and so on. And so one of his friends is, a, he's in his 60s and he's a self-taught mechanical engineer who simply has a, a high school education. And I'm, I'm not gonna mention his name or specifically what he does to protect him, but all that need be known is, so he's in his 60s, he's a brilliant mechanical engineer who taught himself how to build, how to machine special, special, uh, special machines that involve pressure systems and hydraulics and all the rest that do the machining on these specialty parts that go in certain types of vehicles. So he, I've, I've been through his plant and it's, it's fascinating to see and, and to have him explain to me, you know, how he built this such and such machine that plays such and such a role and so on and so forth. R really exceptional. And so, so, so Larry, you know, we spent so much time together. He's heard me go on and on about this, this viewpoint of mine and so we're sitting down with this man one day, we just, we're having something to eat. And he says to him, I'm not going to mention his name. He says to him, James has this idea that, you know, business owners and builders and all these are, are more on the whole competent at what they do than sport coaches are at what they do. So he puts them on the spot. He puts both of us on the spot, you know, in order to test my theory. So he says to his friend, he says, what do you know about what all of your employees do? And he says to him, he says, Larry, he says, I have 300 employees and I can do every one of their jobs. So I said, you know, I said, Larry, I rest my case. Now, do, does this mean that every small business owner and every general contractor and every executive chef and every orchestral conductor, does it mean that every one of them without fail is this glowing example of competency that I'm referring to? No. However, on the whole, it is intrinsic to these professions, unlike the way that it is in sport. Because if we look at the same constituencies, 
which in fact are far less in number in terms of the professions. So they're far less in number. So outside of the sport coaching specialty, we have the medical physiotherapeutic specialty, we have the psychological specialty, we have the non-sports technical specialty of preparation, which is the flavor of the month club, I think these days in terms of what it's called. And so uh, far less constituencies than you know the 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 breadth of orchestral components the breadth of specialty domains that go into building the 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 breadth of gastronomical specialty fields as they result techniques and so on in the kitchen yet uh, how many head sport coaches would one postulate have a could could possibly say the same thing that this individual who's a friend of Larry's said to him. How many of these head sport coaches would say, I have what in effect amounts to at most a dozen, if not less, coaches, let alone 300, what this individual was talking about. How many head sport coaches could say, I have such and such... Uh, psychology, thera therapeutic, non-sports, te technical advancement, etc., cetera, uh, professionals, and I can do every one of their jobs. Well, it's interesting um, because what I seem to come across is you have two types of sport coaches, one that defer and delegate, don't want anything to do with it, right? And just, okay, you tell me what I need to know. And then you have the other ones who think they know it all, even though they have no competence, Um so, but there's nothing in the middle, like you said, and it's interesting. Like I, I had spent the last couple of week or a couple of weeks in December with Benicio del Toro, and we were talking about this in the film industry, right? So the better directors have an understanding of the cinematographer's role, the the sound person, the actors themselves, the writer, you know, and, and the light person. So it's it's interesting uh, that you say that, where you know it's not going to happen across the board, but the better ones will have that knowledge and that, that aptitude to, to understand each of the component parts. That's right. And it's, it's irrefutable. Now, the, the example, the, 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 the physicists who have infam influenced me greatly, David Deutsch, professor of quantum computation at Oxford, um, Richard Feynman, R R Roger Penrose, Stephen Hawking, Neil Turok is the director of the, a fellow, well, he's not, he's not Canadian, but he's the d director of the Perimeter Institute of Theoretical Physics in Waterloo. And Neil Turok is an exceptional thinker and an example of the founder of a culture that is so far in advance of not only the dysfunctional sports culture, but all dysfunctional cultures, including higher education, that are built upon authoritative models. So, for example, he founded an institute in Africa. He's South African. Referred to, it's the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And what it is, is it's a postgraduate institute of which now there are, I believe, eight or nine across the continent of Africa, but the first one began, I think, in Cape Town, but it began in South Africa. And what, what he's intentioning, his intentions are that the next Einstein should come from Africa, Africa because it's so untapped in regards to the lack of infrastructure and so on. And so at the time, he was a, a chair at Cambridge, and they really supported his work. And they so he got these off the ground. It's fantastic. I'd encourage any listener to look into Neil Turok and how he's, he's explained the culture. So it's it's postgraduate. So you're a college graduate if you're accepted there. It's approximately nine months. There are no tests. There are no grades. It's problem solving. It is only problem solving. The instructors, the students, they live amongst each other. There's impromptu conversations that go to all hours of the night at the at the local lounges and you know the first one was a renovated old hotel and it's where the whole the institute everybody lives it's all in the one place and he's spoken a great deal of 
the flawed culture of education, which is fragmented. So, so we apply the, that fragmented criticism to sport and any other hierarchical institution of business or otherwise, and they all are subject to the same sets of problems for the same reasons. And what, what Turok explains is that the, the degree of specialization that has occurred simply slows the creation. It slows the creation of new knowledge because the type of interdisciplinary knowledge that is necessary to solve most problems exceeds the near totality of narrow lanes of specialization that are intrinsic to the specialty fields. So it, it, it's simply an unarguable criticism. And what he has done with, the, with AIMS, AIMS is the acronym for the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences, what he has done is shown this in that there's something on the scale of upwards of a 96% rate, maybe higher, of Ames graduates who go on to become PhDs and researchers in, in science, in medicine, in government. Uh, this uh, close to 100% success rate of highly successful thinkers. And th there is uh, similarly so much that has been stated by physicist David Deutsch, who, who I've quoted extensively throughout my book, and who's spoken a great deal on knowledge creation and the, the flaws of fragmented thinking that are rooted in authoritative doctrine, which is what tends to rule in most educational systems as well as sport coaching and otherwise hierarchies in which these cultures are developed based upon some authority figure put, put in place, often not on the basis of knowledge competency, but rather nepotism and gerontocracy that tends to rule as flawed as it is. And the result is very narrow lanes of specialization that are often not only narrow, but misinformed due to the flaws in education and ultimately broken cultures that slow, if not halt, the possibility for progress at that given institution relative to what is actually knowable. So the differential between what is knowable and how it could apply and what is known is vast and the, 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 the proportion at which it is that much amplified tends to be correspond to the degree of balkanized dysfunction that exists at the institution. So let's jump ahead here. John's kicking me under the table. He wants to ask you something. <laughs> Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm taken aback, especially from your analogous examples in the realm of physics and such, but um, my question is, how do, we, how do we start to shift sport into that frame of mind? Indeed. So it, it must start from the, from the top, and this is what I'm fortunate to do. I mentioned as a consultant, the, the vast proportion of what my efforts are focused on ha have nothing to do with physical fit preparation. In, in fact, as I make an argument for in my book, I am a proponent of the end of the physical preparation, the termination of the industry for reasons that I, we could certainly go into here. I, I, there's quite a, quite a bit of detail in the book. So, who, who, for instance, I'm currently consulting with a, I'm not going to get into specifics, he's a coordinator in the National Football League who's being interviewed for head coaching positions. I am an advisor to him in terms of how I amplify his skill set in interviewing. So uh, this is an example, this is one example in terms of the consulting that I do that has the potential to create change because when I had my first conversation with this individual, I, I conveyed many of the same subject matter components that you've heard me talk about thus far. They are universal principles. They are, they are no more or less specific to anyone regardless of profession. 
And so, so all you need be is a thinker who's not, not con convicted themselves, committed themselves to closed minded thinking. And you will irretrievably, irretrievably be in agreement. The, the only real hang up is the, the recognition that individuals have in con confronting, being confronted with and confronting themselves with the reality that despite the truth in the things that I have to say, this truth it turns many aspects of what everyone has only known completely on their head. And I'll give you another example. A few years ago, I consulted with a American football head coach at the NCAA Division I level, and all he knew about me was that I was a consultant. I was actually um, on a trip for, for special operations purposes, and I was in the vicinity of this university, and I cold called the office, and to the, to the head coach's secretary, all I said was, my name is James Smith, I'm a consultant for various pro teams, and I'd be happy to spend some time with the coach today if he's interested. And, and uh, long story short, he was, and I ended up speaking to him for about an hour and a half. He, he ended up canceling the next two appointments that he had scheduled after me, because I was just, I was talking about what you hear me talking about now, how there shouldn't be, there should not be a strength coach. The practice needs to be called something else and completely reconstituted. And I went into details on, on all the changes that should be made. So he was taking notes and he would ask me to expound upon certain concepts. And at the end of it, it it's, the, it's the same thing that, I'm, that, that, that I hear, no matter who I talk to. At the end of it, he said, James, he says, I gotta tell you, if I was to make all these changes, I'd alienate half my staff because his coordinators were former division one head coaches. It was an older, chronologically older staff. He said, I would alienate half my staff because they'd be faced with the recognition that they've, they've been wrong. They've been wrong their whole careers. And then he followed that with, however, I cannot argue a single thing you've just told me. He says, for that reason, I think I want you to be my personal consultant. Send me your information. And so, the, I mean, the whether it's NFL or Premiership Rugby or Super Rugby, or ba I, I had a, an NBA director of basketball operations after I spoke with a close friend of mine from um, the SEAL teams, spoke to the team, and I was only speaking only on the component of psychology, and all he, similarly to everybody else who I could fault, consult for, he, he only knew that I was a consultant. And so afterwards he said to me, he says, where did you study psychology? And, you know, I, I, I couldn't resist. I says, well, I didn't, but I stayed in the Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> so, so, the, the, so, so these are examples in that knowledge is the only, it's, it's the only relevant topic to discuss. Experience means zero in the context of the knowledge discussion. This, this concept of experiential authority is absolutely false because there is no synonym between knowledge and experience. And David Deutsch has spoken at length about this and I talk about it in the book. So this is why I hesitate to mention any of my experiences due, due to the falsity that is associated despite how prevalent the, the, the acceptance in, in the culture is in associating knowledge with experience, but it's completely wrong. So whether it's job applications or doors being opened to simply have, gain access to speaking with people, just give us an idea who, you know, what, what you've done, who you are, you know, no different than the way that we started this discussion with your initial question. And the, the problem with it is that there is absolutely no credence whatsoever associated with anyone's experience. And I state that specifically in the context of knowledge. We must understand what a person's knowledge is. So, so, so let us take, uh, let's take Charlie Francis, Derek, because you worked so closely with him for so long and 
and, and for me, he was a massive influence on, on how I think about so many of the topics that were most closely represented by his work. And uh, it, th there is no significance to the fact that Charlie contributed to the results of, of Angela or Ben Johnson or any of these others, or, or, or Desai. There is zero significance associated with those athletes' achievements. What was entirely unique about Charlie was that the level of his understanding of the subject matter portrayed by his mode of explanation. That is the evidence of his knowledge, not the fact that Ben Johnson was the first to go under 9.8 and so on. That has nothing to do with his knowledge. And the reason is because many other athletes uh, to date have gone sub 9.8 in the 100 meters due to a variety of different coaching tactics and otherwise. And no one-to-one -one relationship can exist in an environment in which two conscious entities are working together, two or more conscious entities are working together, such as how we must describe any sporting context amongst any other thing in, in the variety of professional domains. What, what this means is, there, by simply virtue of the fact that some athlete or athletes represents their own set of psychological, sensory motor, all aspects of, of genetically inherited traits that affect their motor cortex processing to physical motions, etc. There, there's, there's way too many moving parts between that athlete or athletes and any individual involved with influencing them to credit any single individual with results achieved. And the, the reason is because if, if we see one set of circumstances, the performance of, say, an athlete or a, or a team of athletes in which there is perceived competency from a coaching staff, yet that team does poorly. Let's say there's no change in that and it's the same athlete or the same group of athletes and a different staff comes in and all of a sudden results change for, for the better or for the worse. This, this flux that we see is indicative of the fact that a, the one-to-one -one relationship can't possibly exist because if one variable remains con consistent, which is to say the one that's doing the competing, the athlete or the athletes, the, the, the host of variables associated with even one individual, let alone a group of them, makes difficult the prospect of attributing any degree of global direct influence to the to the the coach now that said clearly the individuals in in charge have an influence however to claim sole authority over an outcome must be flawed due to the volatility that is present in the ever changing climate within one ever evolving human body, let alone a group of them. So all this must be understood. And the, the best that could happen is an analogy that I made for, in which case, particularly professional sports that have access to free agency and drafting and so on, they should be the functional equivalent of NASCAR because NASCAR is structured in such a way where one should not be, a driver should not theoretically be defeated by another car because they're built to run equal. Now, clearly mechanics and crew chiefs and so on have room to operate within that allows them to execute their tradecraft expertise, but ultimately, it's driver beating driver and all that goes into the preparation of the driver. If, if we transplant that to all other sports, 
theoretically, the only way any, it doesn't matter whether it's an individual sport or a team sport, the only way one should be the victor is because of the coaching and no other reason. Uh, the, the set of conditions made available for everyone to achieve that already exist. It's just the knowledge required to achieve that set of conditions does not yet exist. And, it, and it's, it's not for a lack of intellect in my experience. We must distinguish between intellect and knowledge. Uh, in my experience consulting, I have yet to encounter a, a, a head coach or, or some type of assistant coach in all of the different sports who I walked away from thinking this individual does not have the intelligence to carry forward this information that I've supplied them with. I have not encountered that. What I have encountered is met, effectively every individual that I've consulted with just simply not having the knowledge. And the reason is because of the cultural dysfunction that did not promote the acquisition of such knowledge. And, and this is, again, something that physicist David Deutsch has spoken about extensively, cult culture being the reason for the lack of knowledge creation. So, James, um, in changing, I guess, the the uh, the frame of mind for sport, and you mentioned that you need to have somebody at the top that has that knowledge, uh, but surely you must foster those that are coming up in the system and they're going to be those next generation of coaches. Um, how would you, what, what are some suggestions you would have in maybe changing the culture of how uh, the next crop of coaches are mentored so that they have that knowledge when they get into those head coach positions? So I, mentoring is a slippery slope in my judgment. I, in 2012, I was, this, I'm gonna answer your question this way, John. The, in 2012, I was trackside with Lloyd Cowan, one of the national team sprint hurdles coaches for Great Britain uh, for about six weeks for their, their pre-Olympic training pr prior to London. And, you know, Christina Horogu was in Lloyd's group and some great athletes. And during that time, this was in Southern California, the uh, Dan Paff was one of the center directors for UK athletics. And he was with his crew, Greg Rutherford and Steve Lewis and the rest at at some of the same tracks. And, and uh, I, that's, that's when I met Dan. And I spent about two weeks with, 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 with Dan, just trackside, just hanging around while, while he was with his athletes. And uh, we had some great conversations. And, and as, as, as people know who, who know Dan well, he's very much a proponent of the mentor apprentice process. And he and I were speaking one day and I said, you know, I said, uh, I'm not, I'm not a proponent. And the reason is because who's the mentor and who mentored the mentor? Who does that person know? So I, I am not wholesale, um, I'm not sold on, on that concept for those reasons. Who, who, who taught the teacher? What, what, what I am wholesale for is the knowledge that already exists out there and the accessibility of it from anyone who in present day has a, a smartphone with access to the internet. Anyone with a smartphone with access to the internet has access to the near whole of human knowledge. The, so the question isn't accessibility, such as the, the opening quote in my book is a quote from David Deutsch from a TED lecture of his in which he said, the limiting factor is not resources, for they are plentiful, but knowledge, which is, which is scarce. So th this re resource that the web plays host to and all the knowledge contained, yet it's the questions that one asks if given that example, it, you know, what type of Google search efficiency does one, you know, Google search skills, what, what type of Google search skills does one have that allows them to gain access to the relevant knowledge? So that is the key. Now, how, how will developing coaches be successfully educated? Ultimately, this must be by the reformation of coaching education. Now, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. And fortunately, I've already been contacted by one university 
that has expressed potential injure, interest in using my book as the textbook for their coaching education class, which is fantastic. And hopefully I get more of those calls. The Notice I say coaching education, not specifying what type of coach, because it is, it is, it is my argument that, that anyone who's going to influence an athlete in, in any way that ultimately amounts to neuromuscular structural loading, which accounts for all psychological influence and physiotherapeutic and otherwise, must share the same sets of edu educational resources in the same way that when, when we look at what share, what, what do any variety of attorneys, regardless of their specialty, criminal, spousal, tax, government, you name it, doctors, neurosurgery, vascular surgery, orthopedics, internal medicine, just medicine and law, dozens of specialty fields, dozens. However, what does every doctor, regardless of specialty field, every lawyer, regardless of specialty field, what do they have in common? Law school and medical school. Now, is it possible that law school and medical school are as rife with as, as many of the dysfunctions that I've criticized all other educational systems of? I, not, not, not me alone, certainly others have been critical. I mentioned Neil Turok. Of course it's possible. However, the fact that there's this fundamental framework from which all attorneys, regardless of specialty, all doctors, regardless of specialty, must go through is in and of itself an operating unifier that naturally instills a greater degree of competency to those tradecraft professionals, regardless of specialization, because they're commonly linked by this unifier, again, as flawed as it might be. So given an improved educational culture in which the only directive is problem solving, not ta test taking, not teaching to the test, problem solving with an unrestricted, unbridled set of opportunities to advance knowledge by way of criticism. This is key. As expounded by David Deutsch, Neil Turok and others, criticism is the one and only driving force behind knowledge advancement. The one and only. In the absence of it, it can only be authoritative. Certain, David Deutsch has expounded upon how certain societies in, in different countries, I mean, to this day, operate based more on one or the other. We, we can look towards the authoritative realms of communist regimes and others, more of the others who fostered modes of criticism down to the very bones of their cultural establishment. So fortunately, most of the democratic, as one example only, societies are built upon criticisms that that allow for ideas to be challenged, for errors to be corrected, for conjectures to enter the realm of discourse that may lead to new knowledge. This is what the, the part of the educational amendment must consist of that will ensure that the next generation of coaches, regardless of specialty, are to, to, to who knows how many more orders of magnitude more competent than anything we've seen, regardless of the achievements of the successful coaches in a variety of sports. The, what the future, if, if my argument and theory and so on is to become instantiated, what the future will hold will be coaching and the subsequent sports achievements that have not even been imagined by, by people to date. So thank you very much for listening to part one of our performance concepts chat with James Smith. I'm hoping that you got something out of that and that it's raised more answers than questions, but uh, it was a very thought provoking discussion and you may have some more questions. And if you do and you wanna contribute your thoughts, please let us know uh, on Facebook at Strength Power Speed and Strength Power Speed uh, has no vowels in it so it's all consonants and same for Twitter so 
facebook.com strength power speed or twitter.com strength power speed no vowels so i'll uh, i'll add uh, those links uh, as part of the description and so you can uh, when we post this up so you can follow as well so thanks for your time and we look forward to hearing from you Thank <laughs> you.